Uh, well, welcome to Bull Run Distillery. Uh, you came on a good day. Uh, we're, we're full up here with uh, barrels and, act and activity that we finished off this morning. My name is Lee Madoff, and I'm the uh, founder and head distiller here. As you can see, we've got lots of barrels stored through here. Uh, these we just got in the other day. We're going to be dumping, uh, we've been dumping these the past few days. I uh, originally was a brewer, and then I was thinking about becoming a winemaker, and I was working in France. I had a fortunate opportunity to go over there and work, and uh, part of my duties was to distill. And when I came back to the States, I was in the right place at the right time. I used to work for McMinimins, and uh, when I came back, they had just put a distillery in, and I uh, didn't really have anybody to operate it. And so I knew just enough uh, to raise my hand and volunteer myself, and that's what got me started in, the, in distillation. Probably the main thing was that uh, working for McMinimums especially, the idea of experimentation and doing things outside the box. And I think that uh, what we really focus on here at Bull Run is malted barley whiskey. And so uh, I had a chance to play around with that because all the great beers here in the Northwest and pretty much all the great beers in the world are made from malted barley. And it just made sense to distill that and turn that into a whiskey product. And so that's where our real focus here now is to make, make, making American malt whiskey. I fortunately have a lot of relationships with uh, different wineries and right now I'm filling a bunch of uh, barrels from Archery Summit right now. Uh, but we've got them from Brooks uh, Winery, King Estate, uh, Pinner Ash, we've been getting them from everywhere we can find them. Most of our malt whiskey and our experimental things uh, we keep here at this facility. We do our major bottling at a location down in Tigard. Uh, and we also store a lot of barrels down there as well. But pretty much all of our small batch thing, experimental things, as well as uh, really our, our main focus, our malt whiskey is all stored here. All right, and when you come around the corner, this is our uh, main production floor right here. You'll see we've got a lot of barrels. This is our the French oak uh, Pinot Noir barrels from Archery Summit that we uh, just filled up this morning. Uh, these will get uh, tagged and racked uh, later on this afternoon or maybe tomorrow. The dream was to really focus on making whiskey, being a whiskey focused distillery and primarily making American malt whiskey. That I thought would be the great uh, idea. There's no history of making malted barley whiskey in the United States. It's all corn and rye. And it's coming from the brewery, a brewing background, I thought that'd be an ideal ingredient. You know, malted barley is, you know, rich, flavorful, powerful for product. And so using that as a base for a whiskey and giving it a, an idea of originality too. You know, we're not trying to create Scotch whiskey or Irish whiskey or Japanese whiskey, but something truly American. And so that was the real impetus for that. But also to do all things whiskey. I really enjoy whiskey. And so part of our business plan from the very beginning was also to do merchant or independent bottling, uh, which is to buy products of their whiskeys and bring them in and finish them in different ways. And it was probably one of the best decisions we made because it's uh, pretty expensive to uh, operate a distillery. And this allowed us to have product on the market right away, but also allowed us to experiment with a lot of different types of whiskeys and different finishes. Welcome to our tasting room. Uh, this is our public front to the distillery here. Uh, this is where consumers can come in and uh, sample and try uh, our products as well as buy them. Yes, well, so sourcing whiskey is basically, you have two ways of uh, putting a whiskey in the bottle. Think of it that way. One is you make it from scratch. And there's people out there that have their own fields of grain even, and they're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're malting it or not malting it, but they're bringing it in and fermenting that and making their whiskey completely from scratch. But the other way to do it is you can buy whiskey that's already been produced at another location, bring that in, bottle it up or finish it or do different things to it. Uh, personally, I think both uh, things are completely legitimate. I think that's the way it's been done for a long time. Uh, here at Bull Run, uh, we made a conscious decision from the very beginning to do both. And they were, one was a great business decision and allowed us to really uh, focus on making our passion, which is our malted barley whiskey. But as it turned out, you know, being able to source our, our corn whiskeys and bourbons, things like that, allowed us this treasure chest of uh, whiskeys to play with and do all these different line extensions that we have. And especially really focus on this barrel finishing program that I have going on here. I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't have this huge pool of whiskey I, I was able to get. But uh, I think you gotta be honest about it. 
And one of the things that we did from the very beginning as well with our Merchant Bottle products uh, was to state that on the label. Uh, we haven't made any bones about that. We never tried to hide it. And so being true to that is very important, I think, for the consumer to know. I know that in uh, there several years ago, especially, there's quite a controversy. Uh, people were calling people out because they were claiming that they, you know, they've been in business for five years and they had a 12-year-old whiskey. How does that work? The math doesn't, uh, doesn't work. And so I'm all for being honest about things, um, but I don't think there's any you know, shame or any, um, any problem with doing that. You think of great whiskeys out there in the world like uh, Johnny Walker. Uh, that's, a, that's a sourced whiskey. It's probably the most uh, famous merchant bottle product in the world is Johnny Walker. And the Scots are the ones that invented merchant bottling, in fact. Uh, what you would do is a, is a merchant would literally go to a distillery, uh, buy uh, barrels of whiskey, bring it back to their shop, and, and uh, uh, to cut it down or treat it in different ways. And so I think it's really completely legitimate. And I think you'd find also a lot of big brands out there that a lot of people you know, go to a lot on the shelf in the bars and restaurants, they'd be surprised to know that uh, they are merchant bottled as well. Well, when people say that great whiskey only comes from Tennessee or Kentucky, uh, it does. There's some great whiskey that comes from there, but uh, they've got a big head start on us. You know, uh, they, uh, they've been around before Prohibition. They uh, were the first uh, to get back into a production after Prohibition. And so craft distillation has long ways to go. I mean, really, uh, it's only been since the early 2000s that the explosion in craft distillation has happened. So we're really young industry. But what I think is going to be pretty exciting for people to realize is that you can make great whiskey anywhere in the United States. And what's going to be great to see is as another 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, who knows how long it's going to be, but you're going to find that there's great regional style whiskeys coming out. From the beginning, I think craft distilleries, the only model they really had were the big national distilleries. And so I think a lot of people emulated that, emulated what they were supposed to do or try to do as far as marketing and even like sales and packaging, everything. But I think really quickly early on, you realize that you can't keep up with that. It's impossible to do that. And I personally tell people, don't look at the big brands. They've been around far too long. They have far too much money. They're, they're very, very entrenched. And so if you try and go head to head with them, there's no way you can do that. So be more innovative, you know, look for, uh, your market, you know, be, be aware who you're selling this to. If you're trying to sell it to every single person out there, you're going to fail. Find out who your market is, you know, who wants this sort of product. You know, who, who drinks craft beer? Who goes to farmer's markets? I mean, who buys uh, local things? That's what pe that's your market. That's what people are going to be buying what you have, whether you're in Portland or Kansas City or, you know, anywhere else in the, in the country. And so I basically say do not try and compete with the bigger brands. There's, there's no way you can do that. Find a path that's going to work for you. And uh, it's challenging, very, very challenging. The easy part is making the product. The very hard part is in selling it. But once again, you know, there's opportunities now, like with social media, being able to get your product in front of millions of people uh, very inexpensively. And also what's been kind of problematic since I've been distilling for all this time, I've seen the, the traditional supplier distributor relationship change quite a bit. Um, there's uh, less activity on the distributor side to support and promote your products. There's been a lot of consolidation in that industry and it makes it harder and harder for smaller brands to get any sort of traction outside of their you know, backyard essentially. And so with the advent of social media, uh, there's a lot more opportunities for us to do that. And I think that's something that's uh, benefited us quite a bit is, and I kind of see it steamrolling now for us, is that, you know, we come out with these unique products, uh, we can send them to retailers, they, uh, they post things about it, they, they, some, somebody blogs about it, and it gets out to somebody else and somebody else. And it just kind of blooms and blossoms even more. And we've got a lot of business now for people knowing that we do unique barrel finishes and unique products. And we get calls from all around the country for this now. And so it's been a great opportunity for us as well. I, I think part of the hardship, and one of it, uh, fortunately I don't really have to deal with it, uh, other people on my team here have to deal with it, is just uh, if you're gonna do social media, you gotta do it right. It's not a part-time job job. It's a full-time job to keep up with that and keep, keep yourself relevant all the time. And I think uh, quickly on, uh, you know, craft distillers are going to realize what path they really need to take. And it has, a lot has to do with, you know, money and access to distribution. But I think there's a lot to be said for having like a neighborhood distillery. 
you know. Uh, and the fact what's nice here in Oregon especially is you can uh, have a, a distillery bar, just like a brew pub, you know, a, a distillery pub. And I think there's a lot of options for people where you can make a good living and still produce the things you love and care about. But you know, you might not find it in New York, but you can find it all around your backyard. I don't think people realize the cost it takes to make something from scratch. We already you know, kind of touched on that, but I think that people don't realize the expense it takes and the time and energy it takes to make something completely from scratch and get that into a bottle. And I really respect a lot of my peers out there, in fact all my peers out there that are doing that. And uh, pretty much all of us have at least one, two or several products that they're making completely wholly from scratch. And that's a real monumental effort and I'm very impressed that, uh, that we're able to do it on the scale that we're able to do it. Well, seeing people enjoy my product is probably, you know, part of the joy of having a distillery is, you know, I'm making this not just for me. If, uh, if I was doing it just for me, I, there's only one thing I'd probably make. <laughs> but uh, but uh, allowing me to experiment and try things and, and see people enjoy that is great, great satisfaction. Uh, we're open uh, Wednesday through Sunday, uh, noon to six. And uh, this gets quite crowded on weekends, uh, which is nice. But uh, yeah, feel free to come on by.